Reportedly today we're going to get something from the government that's going to provide some kind of assistance to farmers, maybe as much as $15 billion to offset any losses from the trade war. What are you hearing from farmers about what they need? Well, what we need is the trade deals to be, um, you know, to be finished. You know, this has been a, a three to five year period of time for low commodity prices for farmers, and everybody knows Land O'Lakes for our dairy business and our butter business are our leading brands. But actually, we are a food production and agribusiness. We go, we're farmer owned, right to the store shelf, and so we have a number of growers as well, bean growers, uh, corn growers, and then of course um, our dairy business. What we're hearing is that there is going to be some some uh, market facilitation payments, some interim payments, and those will be helpful. But more than anything, the farmers want trade deals finished. Uh, so in the meantime, though, with the $12 billion from last year, maybe $15 billion plus, uh, a lot of compensation if you're a soybean farmer, for example. If the trade war lasts, is that enough? Like, can farmers stay afloat with that? I think it, it depends on what the, the program is going to be. We're hearing maybe a couple dollars a bushel, but we don't know. And um, as you can imagine, that's the bean growers. On the dairy side, they really, out of the first payments, only received about $250 million in total. It wasn't enough to offset the market fall um, when uh, the trade deals weren't completed. So the dairy pr uh, producers especially have been under challenging um, industry dynamics. We're seeing two dairy farmers a day go out of business in Wisconsin, a heritage dairy state. So it is a very tough operating environment. So, so Beth, one problem is the plight of the farmers, which was a, there was a, that was a tough situation before the trade dispute came along and whether they're going to get compensated. Another is the government intervening in that marketplace and giving certain subsidies to some crops. What is the risk, in effect, it will distort the marketplace? For example, I've read some things about whether you plant soybeans rather than corn because soybeans come up faster. That's right. And you know what's, the, what's pressuring the market right now, the pressuring the farmers right now is the weather. The weather has not been helpful. There's a delayed planting season in some of the core, uh, core uh, farm states, Indiana, Ohio. Um, and so what we're seeing now is decisions are being driven not just by trade. And that's one element. It's really being driven right now by the weather pattern. Uh, it's too wet for the farmers to get in the field. I think that we're, you know, 43 percent or so planted. Normally you're at 88 percent or more and so it's taking decisions you know out of the uh, you know out of their lens for them to make and so the, we've got a number of elements right now the primary one actually is weather yeah and sort of moving uh, moving to soybeans planting more soybeans which weighs on the right. price which just makes it all worse for a soybean farmer so uh, Beth for you um, if you end up seeing the trade impact you know continue say like for a year or even longer as some economists are re-rating their base cases where does that hurt? I mean, is it more consolidation? Is it margins? Like, what's the end result? Yes, 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 right? <laughs> so it's, it's yes all. What we're seeing is consolidation happen in the sector. You know, you're seeing, um, as I say, animals move, acres shift, um, because you can only hold on for so long in a low um, commodity price environment. You know, I am so impressed with farmers. You know, we are farmer owned. I'm so impressed with farmers. They are incredibly resilient. They work, and a lot of them are onto the, into their balance sheet now. They're using loans. They've been losing money for a, a few years. But what they're trying to do is work through towards income diversification. They're looking at different ways they can be um, entrepreneurs. Uh, and I think of them as the original entrepreneur. Uh, they figure it out too hot, too cold, too wet, too dry, trade issues, and they figure it out. But what you're going to see is consolidation in the sector in, uh, at the farm level, uh, at the animal level, and then, of course, up and down the sector. Beth, in other industries, when we hear about consolidation, it's uh, two big companies getting together. In, in the farming business, we hear about agribusiness and the shift from family-owned farms to really big corporations. Are the pressures of trade and perhaps weather as well going to accelerate that process? Well, we are seeing an acceleration, but I want to be very clear. 96% of farms are still family-owned. So what yeah. happens? What happens is, you know, a, a, an individual doesn't have somebody to pass their, um, their farm on to. And it's next to a neighbor. And so they say, we're going to sell the farm. And so the neighbor acquires the farm or leases the farm. So there is consolidation acres move. But I think that there's a narrative that, you know, there's, it's going to big corporate farms. And, and yes, there is uh, increased scale, but I want to be very clear. 96% of farms are still uh, family owned. Um, and so that, that, uh, that narrative isn't actually uh, you know, directly on point. 
Uh, and, and I want to know what this means more specifically for Land O'Lakes. I mean, I'm looking at, say, Dean Foods, which before all this got worse, they were already really struggling, desperately wanting to sell themselves, but no one's taking uh, the bait with that. Um, how do you play that trend? I mean, do you look to buy certain assets, like from Dean Foods, for example? Do you just kind of sit back and wait till it uh, assesses out? Well, you know, Land O'Lakes isn't really in the drinking milk business. We are in butter, cheese, um, we have Vermont Creamery, Cozy Shack puddings, you know, so we are in different elements of the dairy sector. But of course, all of it plays together. Sometimes we have supply agreements for, um, for drinking milk businesses. How do we see it will play out? Well, you know, again, we see investment in parts of the country. We see animal numbers and animals shifting in different parts of the country. We pay attention to it all the way back to the producer level. For our direct business, it's all about innovation. We are focused on innovation in the dairy um, portfolio, new products, new product entrants into the marketplace, partnering differently with uh, retailers because retailers are going through their own consolidation, grocery retailers. Um, and so there are a variety of ways we're thinking through this at the farmer level, mm -hmm. but also at the store shelf level. It's a good point, Beth. Uh, I also want to sort of wrap up talking about what's happening with hogs. And uh, in China, the swine flu that's just devastating. It's at three continents now. There's also worms that are infected. Uh, the pigs there. We talk, uh, we talk a lot about how soybeans getting hit by trade, but that's some fundamental soybean meal demand that's going to be lost because of the hog production. How, what are you hearing? Yeah, we're hearing the same thing. I mean, we're, we see a significant portion of, um, of that industry coming out. I think I, I heard 20, 25 percent. So you're right, there's some industry fundamentals, and that's why I say, you know, we, we talk a lot about trade. You're right, um, trade is a, a significant issue, but there are so many other factors I brought up earlier, the weather factor, and then, you know, the, the swine flu is another uh, issue impacting uh, producers and impacting the sector. Uh, Beth, Beth, before we let you go, I do want to ask one question. When you came in, I guess it was last summer, summer of uh, 2018, uh, it was yeah. reported that you were the first openly gay woman to be a CEO. Uh, mm -hmm. What difference does that make? What difference does that make to Lando Lakes? What does that difference that, uh, does that make to you r interacting with other corporations? Well, it doesn't really. Um, I, you know, again, the, I was chosen for the role because the board believed I was best suited to drive the strategic performance that they were uh, focused on and that we were aligned to. You know, this business is a, a member-owned business, so what they were also clear about is I was aligned with their families and their members, and I, of course, I hold them in in high regard. So it wasn't one of the uh, criteria. Uh, at the same time, I think we celebrate that it certainly didn't hold me back from being named to that position, and it really. Has had no implication. It's not something we discuss. It's not part of the criteria. It really is about whether I can drive performance in the business and aligned with their view of the marketplace. And I think both of those things are, are the truth.